So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another event organized uh, within the European Distance Learning Week, which uh, Eden has uh, and, and started and uh, for the first time, uh, based on previous uh, very good cooperation with the uh, American uh, Distance Learning Week. And uh, I'm happy that uh, through whole of this week, we have a number of webinars with aim to uh, raise more awareness about the issue of uh, distance learning, about uh, the, the digital technologies, uh, modern education, uh, all things which um, uh, surround us uh, and which are very much uh, uh, the, the importance of today uh, uh, when we are talking about education. So uh, today webinar uh, is uh, titled, uh, as you can see, Validation and Recognition of Non-Formal Open Learning. And uh, it is the fourth webinar in the row uh, since this uh, week. So I hope you are still eager to participate and join us today and tomorrow for the last webinar we have. Uh, today uh, I have three speakers. Uh, Andrea Inamorato dos Santos from uh, GRC CV from European Commission, uh, Irina Volungeviciena from Vitatus Magnus University in Lithuania, who is hosting me for this webinar as well. So we are room to room uh, now, and Gordana Yugo from Croatian Academic and Research Network, Arnet uh, from Croatia. Uh, I'll be moderating uh, today uh, this webinar, uh, okay, and I'm saying hello to all our participants uh, in the chat and uh, um, hello everyone, great to have you today with us. Uh, we are talking, uh, going to talk about the, the issue of, uh, of um, uh, non-formal open learning. But uh, uh, it means not only non-formal, uh, informal learning uh, as well. And uh, before starting with the first presentation, uh, I will just uh, ask uh, colleagues uh, to, to give us uh, questions. We prepared two questions for you to try uh, to see uh, what you think uh, about them. So let's just have uh, questions from the pool. Yes, uh, the first question is, uh, what is the difference between online, formal, non-formal and informal education? So you have a number of possibilities here to choose. Uh, we will uh, later, you can uh, answer the questions uh, during the webinar. We will uh, in, at, what, on, at one point um, uh, try to discuss uh, the result. And if we can have also another question as well at the same time, uh, I hope they will uh, they will uh, be so. Can they be both together at the same time? The second question is, who can issue certificate uh, award of qualification for online non-formal and informal course? So uh, here is uh, here are the questions for you to think about a little, uh, and we can discuss it uh, later. And now I'm going to give a floor to Andrea Inamorato, who will present the uh, European Commission uh, work uh, on this uh, topic. So Andrea, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sandra. I'd like to say hello to, to my colleague speakers and to the entire network that is joining us today. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here uh, today again, showing a little bit of, of our research work uh, on different aspects of open education. I can see that some participants also joined yesterday, so it's nice to see your names there again. Um, and so um, I participated yesterday uh, more talking about open education as a whole, giving an overview of our understanding of open education here at the GRC, at the Joint Research Center in Seville. And today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about a specific study that we ran between 2014 and 2015, which deals with recognition of non-formal learning, which is called, amongst ourselves, the Open Cred study. Uh, some people that carried out this study um, are joining us, uh, such as Gabby Whithouse, 
welcome and please feel free to to collaborate and and bring in your knowledge as well gabby because you were uh, one of the main authors of this study and we welcome your contributions okay so um just a second i need to rearrange my screen okay so here we go i wanted to say that um, um recognition or validation and perhaps it would be interesting to discuss a little bit about this terminology uh, recognition validation informal non formal i think it's important that we touch upon this aspect later but validation recognition of non formal learning has been in the european agenda for a while so if you have a look at this slide we have the council recommendation dated 2012 saying that by 2018 we should have some sort of arrangements for validation of non-formal learning. Apart from that, uh, something else that supports our, our studies uh, on open education and on recognition in particular is the um, 2013 uh, European Commission's communication on opening up education, which sets upon open educational resources and the importance of pushing the field forward. So all these studies we carry out here at GRC in Seville uh, are also in order to support this communication a little bit more. And this open credit study is one of them. So very briefly, I will try and present these three things. First of all, the Open Edu project and locate the open credit study within the open edu project which is the overarching project hosting this study on recognition and then specifically show one of the of the uh, i'd say important most important outcomes of this uh, uh, study open cred which is the traffic light model which is a sort of a visual representation for for um, open learning offers MOOCs OERs uh, but, but mostly MOOCs that universities can use to help a, uh, to help um, aid, let's say, future recognition of learning, of open learning. So, very briefly, open edu, the Open Edu project. Um, I think I've given you a brief introduction. It started in 2013. Uh, it ended in 2016, beginning of this year, uh, and we had a number of publications related to this project. Um, and in which open credit is one of them. And now we have a, uh, uh, a follow-up study called Open Edu Policies, in which we are dealing with the more overarching level of policy making at both national levels and regional levels in Europe uh, in relation to open education. So this is the most uh, recent project that we have. But in order to be able to carry out all this research in, in, in open education, we had to have a working definition of open education. Because open education, as you know, means something different to different people. You know, no matter who you ask, uh, you may have a different answer. We've, we've done that before many times here, just to try it out. And some people will focus on open educational resources, others will, fo will focus on MOOCs, others will, will have a more broad perspective and overview and try and combine different perspectives, OER, MOOCs, technologies, recognition yeah and the, what we wanted to show uh, was that um, by means of our evidence in research was that uh, open education for us is understood as something that goes well beyond OER and MOOCs. OER and MOOCs are part of open education as much as recognition the theme that we are discussing today because recognition can be a, a, a strong enabler of open educational practices and also an enabler of modernization of higher education in Europe. So as you can see from this, this definition that we had, we discussed with many experts along the Open Edu project, and we included, uh, we, we talk about open education being uh, um, a variety of access routes to formal and non formal education, bring, bridging them, bringing them together and making this bridge. And here is the importance of, of the subject uh, that we are discussing today. Okay, so here's the overview of the Open Edu project. So you can see above we have four four studies being part of this um, of this project. Two of them are on a qualitative basis, which is open cases and open cred, the one I'm talking about today. And two of them uh, have a more quantitative perspective: the open survey and the MOOC knowledge. So the open cases study is published, and it's a collection of nine case studies exploring open educational practices within higher education institutions in one enterprise in Ireland in particular, 
OpenCred I'm going to talk about um, in a minute. Open Survey is a representative survey of five countries, um, Germany, Poland, UK, Spain and France, in which we asked these countries, these universities, what were their practices in relation to open education, what sorts of things they did, whether they offered MOOCs, whether they had an open access policy, whether they were simply trying to increase the use of technologies to, to widen reach. So, um, and, and open, open Survey is also published as much as OpenCred, and if you are interested, you can find more about it. And we also included a question on, on recognition, um, and I'll show you the results in a second. In MOOC knowledge is a study on or MOOC learners, it's ongoing. Now, with all this information, we, we created the Open Edu framework. I mean, the, apart from in-house research, consultations, workshops with university rectors from 19 countries, online consultations with experts, and this is all what has aided us to, to come up with the, with the framework itself. And I think it's important to show the framework because uh, one of the dimensions of open education that we have identified is recognition. So the work I'm talking about today, we like to see placed here in the recognition dimension with all its importance, but not only that, um, I think it's important to, to, to state that when we created this framework with this visual representation, we wanted to show that these dimensions do not work in isolation. They are depending upon each other and much better when they work together. So if you're talking about recognition of non-formal learning, we may also be talking about developing university strategies for that, having new technologies for that, making sure we have quality on assessment and make sure we have leadership on that type of project. So it, um, I just wanted to emphasize that they all working alongside each other, okay? Okay, so moving on. The Open Credit Study, here is the form of reference to it. It's called Validation of Non-Formal MOOC-Based Learning. So in the end, it ended up focusing more on, on MOOCs. And from our side here at the IPTS, I'll show you um, a little bit of our main motivations to have this study. At the time, in 2014, when we come up with the research design of, of this study, we wanted to know, MOOCs were are still popular, but at, at the time, perhaps even more like fashionable talking about MOOCs. And we wanted to understand what sort of impact having a MOOC certificate could have to a learner. That was the main motivation. And we decided to triangulate the research methods and investigate the perspective of the learner um, themselves, the perspective of the, the professor or the lecturer who was then going through changes and developing new ways of teaching, going through the challenges of designing and offering MOOCs, seeking for university approval and, and you know all, all what comes with it and you, if you are involved in MOOCs, you, you must know that it's not always that easy. But we also wanted to know the perspective of the employers. So if you have uh, a non-formal certification, um, what's the acceptance of it by the employers themselves? So we wanted to triangulate. It was perhaps very early days, and we did do desk research on all the 28 member states trying to identify cases that would be, that would highlight those issues for us. We didn't find information from all, all the uh, member states, but, but we did find from some of them. So we carried out interviews with the professors, the lecturers that were uh, creating the MOOCs, we interviewed uh, two learners studying those MOOCs. So it was interesting because we had the perspective of the lecturers that created and offered the MOOCs, and then of the learners who took those MOOCs, okay? And then we talked uh, on a different perspective with uh, staff members of employer bodies in terms of how they perceived uh, um, this type of accreditation. We have case studies in the report, and this is the, the cover of the report itself. Okay, um, as I said, some in some countries we didn't have uh, any relevant information at the time. Now, I mentioned a little bit about uh, terminology before, and one of the things that came up very strongly and more towards the end of, of our research process 
was that we needed to differentiate credentialization and recognition because very often we are using terminology interchangeably and we are not quite sure what we mean by them or you, we, we, you may say I actually mean credentialization but I'm talking about validation and recognition so we may we may sure and try and bring a little bit of a discussion of these items they may not necessarily be seen as definite someone else may have a different perspective on it and, and uh, criticize it, it's absolutely fine, but we did try and, and, and make it a bit more explicit and consulted other types of literature like CEDEFOP and other sources, European sources, to come up with this. So when we talk about credentialization, we are actually talking about the act of issuing a credential to the learner. So the learner studies and the university then, then issues a credential to, to certify that learning. And that can be a badge, that can be a, cert a certificate, that can be some sort of, of, of credential, okay? More formal or more informal. Now, recognition, however, is what would come afterwards. Our understanding is that a learner who has the, cred the credential could then seek recognition of that credential. And that could be inside of the same institution which issued that credential, for example, for, mo for moving from one course to another, from one faculty to another, to uh, compile with CTS credits towards a degree, or it could be externally, uh, seeking recognition with uh, another institution or even another institution in a different country, okay? And when we are preparing to offer MOOCs and open learning, perhaps we should be thinking of all these possibilities of all that learners could perhaps want to do with that certification, with that credential afterwards. Okay, so explore that a little bit. Okay, one important thing that we had is the, the traffic light model, um, which is this one. I'll come back to the other slide in a second. Uh, as I mentioned before, so this is a visual representation of what we thought would be interesting for a MOOC, for example, to have on its very front page. Okay, when a learner is searching for a MOOC or is searching for a subject to study, what we realize is that sometimes there's not enough information on the course itself. It's not clear how assessment will take place. It's not clear what sorts of recognition can be sought afterwards. It's not, many things are not really clear to the learner, you know? And so, and so having this traffic light model, like as a, as a quick way for the learner and for the institution and for people who will in the future perhaps recognize that credential to help them think through of the different aspects that were contemplated in that course, in that MOOC. So first of all, uh, the colors there um, um, indicate, the, the, the green color indicates the more likelihood, a more strong presence of these aspects here that we say, for example, green is strong in terms of identity verification or supervised assessment. Yellow, to some extent, those aspects are present, and red is when those aspects are not present at all. And so, uh, these, these items here, identity verification of the learner, for example, was one of the most important ones, a very important issue. So recognition, then, is very much linked to assessment practices. So this is another fi important finding for us. If we have uh, um, proper assessment practices, um, and that we can show in a transparent way how assessment has been done, it's much more likely that in the future that credential will be suitable for recognition, okay? Uh, so I'll come back a little bit to the previous slide and show uh, the six elements that support recognition uh, according to the Open Credit Study. So as previously mentioned, the identity verification of the learner, we think it should be very transparent uh, the way the identity verification is done. One of the interesting things is that um, it was also mentioned in the report that sometimes uh, proctoring and this, this type of monitoring at a distance of assessment is not always perceived as something reliable to employers or, or to the external world. Um, one of the learners actually mentioned that specifically. Um, he says people perceive that a course that was assessed online may have a lower value than a course that ha that was assessed face to face. And this is why there is a model in, in the Open Credit Report in which the learner actually could pay and go to the institutions 
to the institution itself in seated assessment on the presence of the actual lecturer who offered the course online. And it was interesting because in this particular case, the learner said, it's expensive, so that may be a barrier because it costs more having face-to-face uh, -face assessment of an online course. But on the other hand, for me, it's good for two reasons. First of all, because I really wanted to meet the professor face-to-face. -face. I really like the way he teaches. I am a fan of his work, and I think it's an opportunity to meet him. Uh, but also because it will increase the value of my certificate of my credential. So this is something for us to think about and perhaps discuss a bit more. I will have only two or three minutes more and I'm, I'm done. Then, uh, and that relates particularly with suitable supervised assessment. In that case, suitable was identified to be more face-to-face -face than online, although online technologies uh, are every time more and more reliable. Okay, so I'm not arguing myself for one or the other. I'm just showing some of the things that came up in our study. Um, the importance of offering badges or digital certificates and also because of all the metadata that can be contained in those types of credentials which can be more easily transfer transferred from one place to another. We are nowadays every time more thinking about blockchain technologies for this type of uh, uh, accreditation and recognition. So it's re metadata is really important. Quality, quality assurance, absolutely, it was present all the time. We have to make sure that the assessment has quality. The award of ECTS credits was seen as something important and partnerships and collaboration. So just to mention one, one item, um, one, um, they, one type of data that we have from the open survey or the survey of the five countries, uh, we asked about collaboration in MOOCs in those five European countries in terms of recognition of the learning, okay? And out of five countries in, uh, that we investigated, that we surveyed, 41.4% said to us that they pursue national recognition of their MOOCs, okay? So those credentials would be valid inside of their countries. And 3.9%, 3.9% of those five countries said they were already pursuing cross-border international recognition of those MOOC credentials, okay? So just, just as just an information. Um, and just to finish, uh, we, had, we had some recommendations towards the end of the report, and I mentioned some of them, that we need to have more transparent information, we need to disseminate good, good practice, and I think this, this webinar already serves, no, uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, meets these recommendations. Um, and here is the, is the open cases report. Also, because we have examples in there that deal with um, recognition. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't go too much beyond my time, but uh, I'm willing to get your questions if you have Thank them. you, Andrea. Uh, can you look at the, the, the questions in the pool and give your first impression uh, on the answers? Uh? For the first questions between difference okay, between uh, uh, in the, okay between formal non formal and informal learning okay um, we had to look into that for this report and we uh, we took the perspective of CDFOP. CDFOP has a publication which is about terminologies used in education and they define formal, non-formal, and informal. And we think that was a very coherent way of defining uh, those three things. So by formal, we understand, you know, there is usually a, a, an institution uh, accrediting or certifying or stamping that credential. The non-formal side, the non -form, a non-formal course, for example, MOOCs are very often, depending on how they are offered, they can be seen as non-formal. To the open learner, for example, they can be non-formal course, a non-formal course. To uh, when it is embedded within um, the curriculum and is part of the assessment and final grade, uh, it can be formal. So it depends. Non-formal normally has some sort of, uh, of curriculum path. The content has been thought of by somebody and put it in some sort of order, let's say. It, it doesn't happen that naturally as much as in the informal type of learning. Uh, the informal type of learning normally is that learning that we do when we are uh, 
um, talking to friends uh, that we acquire at work, doing different tasks, you know, when you're helping your, your child to do the homework, for example, you're learning a new recipe, watching TV, reading newspaper, it's more informal, but, but something that you can build upon, such as professional experiences that you acquire at work, but not necessarily with the final intention to, to learn that particular thing without a structure, without a curriculum or a set structure behind, that's really what we understand, normally what we understand by no okay. Informal. okay, thank you. Thank you for the moment. We'll go, we'll move on and then go back to, to the questions, to more questions. So um, now uh, I'm asking Irina to uh, present the, the new project, the, the new Erasmus Plus project, uh, which has just started, and uh, uh, Vitatus Magnus University is the uh, uh, project leader in this project, in this uh, reopen project. So, Irina, can you tell us what we are aiming to do in order to uh, enhance the recognition of non-formal learning? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to have this opportunity uh, that we have this issue on the agenda at Eden Organized European Distance and E-Learning Week. Because uh, when we hear our discussions uh, among member organizations, I know that higher education is a little bit more active on the issue. However, more and more um, uh, we uh, open the question how to involve companies and how to establish collaboration, and how to agree, and how to have practices and experiences and cases on already existing uh, good practices of linking uh, these different types of learning, especially in the context of open learning. Our project is called Reopen, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't put the title, uh, which is official, and it sounds like recognition of valid and open learning. Uh, as Andrea presented, um, the project was based exactly on the recommendations of Joint Research Center uh, study on validation of non-formal MOOC-based learning, which uh, appeared just in February 2016. However, uh, it helped us immensely to finalize and shape actually our ideas that we have been developing with the partnership and then after the appearance of this study, we just clicked everything and everything seemed to be in their places. So we um, gained more of self-confidence to finalize the application to submit and our application was successfully funded. So now we have, of course, a lot of questions and challenges. And uh, just currently we had the, our partner meeting and here we have partner, uh, partners and participant list and you can see uh, them under reopen project team in uh, in participant list here, so they are in the neighboring room. So we address priorities of open and innovative education, training, and youth work embedded in digital era, transparency and recognition of skills and qualifications to facilitate learning, employability, and labor mobility. So that those issues are definitely addressed by these topics, as well as access to training and qualifications for all. We target it as CVET because actually our target group is teachers, trainers, adult educators, lifelong learning uh, educators. So we move out of uh, the area, out of scope of higher education, but actually our bigger aim is to establish collaboration among different, different uh, sectors of education. So in terms of uh, opening up initiative, of course, we uh, focus on organizational change and on curriculum opening up. And uh, we uh, agree that we do not um, target specifically MOOC, but uh, we target different types of curriculum designing models and scenarios that would be um, meeting uh, uh, opening up initiative as well. The consortium that joined, uh, you can see now on this uh, slide, so we have experienced partners uh, who are the very experienced, for example, in open learning, but also some partners who have long uh, um, uh, tradition and uh, last, long-lasting experience in uh, uh, recognition of prior and uh, non-formal uh, learning. Also, uh, distance learning. We have companies, we have lifelong learning providers. 
So we think that we have representatives for our aims and uh, objectives. So now you see clearly the study addressed and what we especially highlighted and grasped from the idea of the study is that we are aim at establishing validated open learning practices. Uh, I don't know if this is exactly actually how Andrea and how uh, Gabi can, can interpret now, but this is exactly how we put it in our project. So in other terms, we want actually to create validated open learning space, uh, to experiment it and to have it as a case and to have internal decisions whether we are ready and how we are ready to mainstream with different types of organizations. So we, uh, we, we, we really are interested in playing with this. Uh, another thing that we address directly is offering learning credentials. And today we agreed with our uh, consortium representatives that actually we want to uh, prepare a very short uh, survey to be distributed among uh, education providers, asking them what existing practices they have in terms of authorization verification of learners, whether they have experiences and cases of learning agreements, what are the elements of the learning agreements if they have? And also, if they have these instruments in place or if they plan to have it. And then we want to have interviews and to approach for the how, what solutions to accept in the project. So, the third item would be establishing digital badges for recognition of learning achievements. But after discussions again with the partnership and also following the study recommendations, we think to look at the term of recognition a little bit in the broader sense so that we don't take it only for certification and already recognizing learning achievements but going uh, through recognition of learning path and this is also what we identified in, in, in the previous mentioned study and that was very useful for us. Now we identify that it is very rapidly and it is very rapidly developing is that different platforms already mm -hmm. offer monitoring of learning results tools that can be applied through the whole learning process. So in other, in other words, we don't only want to see the learning result, but also to measure the learning process. Uh, the discussion went, for example, if we are in the context of higher education, we know that sometimes universities, even in the exchange agreements, in the collaboration agreements, they do not offer very easily recognized learning outcomes achieved in a different organization. Not even talking about open learning environment, but also within a closed virtual learning environment. Uh, why? Because, for example, in mathematics, we can have different solutions, different approaches to the solution, and that is why it is not only the result that matters. So this is addressed in the project. Uh, and, of course, the biggest target is establishing of collaboration with institutions of different types to provide transparent information on potential recognition of open and online learning and to help them to prepare uh, to, uh, to design curriculum for open and online learning for recognition. So, as I mentioned, we have very broad target, uh, but it is within the interest of our experiment which is the teachers and trainers from different levels of education institutions. So now to concrete aims and objectives, Reopen aims to create instruments to develop validated open and online learning for recognition of prior and informal learning. And they will be reached through the following objectives. So the first objective is to design a platform for non-formal open learning curriculum. And partners may choose whether it will be for MOOC or whether it will be for not massive open online course, development with learning validation and recognition instruments in place. So we are going to implement learning credentials and for uh, authorization of learners, for verification of learners, for uh, tracking their learning process. Digital badges will be one of them, where we plan to have other tools like learning progress measurement tools and uh, maybe informi information system for the learners and other things. Of course, we discussed today that actually European uh, uh, organizations have very, very different um, scenarios. They have very different traditions. 
from, let's say, apl application of already existing e-government tool. Whenever we can have a request for our learners in universities to log in with their, let's say, e, um, e card and e-identification data until uh, very simple tools. So we will see which solutions will be applied in the project. But then, of course, the next uh, item which is very important is to train teachers and trainers at CVET organizations, companies and higher education institutions and adult learning organizations to design how to design a validated non formal open learning curriculum. I think this is this will be one of the major achievements because it will involve application of digital badges as an example of credentialization, tracking one's learning path, and then uh, to recognize non formal open learning results in formal curriculum. So for, for this Objective, it is very important that we have uh, roundtable discussions with all stakeholders involved, involving companies. And then um, we will all benefit from this because we will somehow find the ways to introduce companies at a very early stage, negotiating competences or learning outcomes that are usually embedded in online learning environments. And this way, maybe the bottom-up approach will be to approach uh, program committees in formal higher education institutions, also stakeholders in VET, to review their programs in terms of agreements with the company. We'll see how we will manage. The third objective is to exploit the new platform and to design on formal open learning courses for continuous professional staff development. So these are short-term courses. And then, of course, to establish future partnership for collaboration. So we have now, when, when we started, only kicked off our project, we have a lot of questions uh, pending and issues raised already. And we are now already discussing how to approach them. And we have agreed upon uh, surveys and interviews uh, about roundtable discussions and dissemination events in order to collect as, as much uh, information as possible, as many recommendations and existing cases from uh, uh, countries involved. So, first of all, recognition of learning results versus recognition of learning process. So, how are we going to measure that? Validation of learning results versus validated learning environment. Recognition of open learning and non-formal learning in formal learning. So, how we can prepare the templates for this and how to, to move slowly through them. Multilateral agreement among education providers and companies on recognition of learning. How can we go with this? For example, if we have, let's say, a very regular virtual learning environment within an organization, maybe we can start with that to involve companies and to, to review uh, already uh, learning outcomes and competences that are inserted by default in the virtual learning environment and have uh, validation and recognition of a company. Then verification of learners in open learning environments versus verification of learners in traditional virtual and online learning environments. So comparison of those two. Uh, is it really the learning outcome that we recognize? So this issue is raised for several times. So actually up to now we recognize the learning outcome. That, but it, this this was actually a long way until we realized that uh, open learning is something uh, more than uh, than uh, than what we can imagine because we in in traditional universities in traditional that organization we we recognize outcome competence but we don't uh, care actually a lot how this was achieved how can we measure recognition of achievement and that verification of learners solve the issue of assessment. What do we assess? So actually, when we uh, have very, very simplified discussions on uh, cheating, on, on uh, how we can be sure that our learners uh, are those that are actually participating in the learning process, and very often talking about distance learning, we have these questions raised in, in traditional um, campus-based universities and also vet organizations we usually have methodological answers, saying that it's up to the methodology how assessment is being prepared. But now, with the verification of learners, I think we will uh, be one step advanced, and we 
will be more secured and we will have i i don't i don't have any doubt that our um, uh, departments of it and also departments that are responsible for verification of learners in virtual learning environments will be uh, advanced after we have cases and we share them so we uh, we start we will reach the answers we will find our solutions but at the moment we are at the kickoff and of course uh, plan uh, step by step how we will implement that so I am not uh, presenting today to you the learning, uh, uh, the intellectual output. Actually, all of them meet uh, the the objectives uh, that I just mentioned to you. But uh, one intellectual output which will be very interesting, it will be cases and scenarios, how this is achieved. So then we, of course, will arrange uh, awareness campaign and we'll introduce it to you. So thank you very much. For thank your you, Irina. Uh, can you uh, also can uh, comment on the first question here in the pool? What is your opinion? Uh, for ex if you see that uh, validation got 94 uh, percent uh, and assessment, but for example, uh, the quality or duration provider are, are lower lower in the percentage uh, of difference. Uh, what is your comment on on this? I agree with it very much. I think the quality must be the same actually in any type of uh, educa education service. And I think quality requirements uh, may differ in terms of me uh, measured indicators like, for example, the length, uh, duration. Uh, so yes, uh, duration maybe can be different. Uh, but you know, uh, also uh, I agree uh, that we must pay attention to uh, how we recognize, and I, I don't uh, see uh, actually recognition now here, <laughs> uh, but maybe this is the most important difference uh, in, in these types of learning. So I agree that quality is not the difference. Uh, we may compare uh, quality of for non-formal courses themselves, but uh, okay. maybe not the time. Thank you. Um, now we will go to the case study to see how one course, a non-formal course MOOC in this case uh, look like and what is the experience after doing such a, a course. So today with us uh, uh, is uh, Gordana Yugo from Croatian Academic and Research Network. Carnet, and she will present the course uh, a MOOC on Moodle uh, they have created. Uh, so, Gordon, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Sandy, very much. I'm very happy to be uh, here today at this Eden um, webinar, and uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share with you uh, our case study about the uh, Moodle MOOC that we uh, developed and delivered. Uh, this is about a non-formal open learning opportunity for the development of digital competencies of Croatian teachers. I'm going to talk also about um, validation and recognition, but I'm going to give you a bit of uh, some context so you can understand uh, what actually happened. Uh, I need to tell you just a few words about Croatian Academic and Research Network I work for, uh, this, uh, because uh, also to, to give you a big picture. So actually, we, uh, we are National Research uh, and ed Education Network, and we provide connectivity for all primary and secondary schools in Croatia. There are about 1,400 uh, schools in Croatia. We also provide connectivity for all higher education institutions in Croatia, about 250 of them. This is only the basis for all other services or all other support that we actually provide for our users which are all those institutions and individual users like students, teachers, and other employees. Uh, we support integration of ICT in teaching and all other processes that go on in schools and universities. Uh, I just mentioned two examples like e-class register, uh, which uh, is uh, provided in many schools in Croatia. That means that uh, teachers uh, and and other who, who need to use it. They actually don't use paper class register, but they, they use web application instead. Also, we 
provide a Moodle for our users. At the moment, we have about uh, 5,800 uh, courses uh, of different teachers that we host, and also there are about uh, 120,000 uh, users at all, including students and teachers. Uh, we also uh, provide a lot of teacher training uh, in development of digital competencies. Uh, this Moodle MOOC is one of the uh, courses that we actually provide for teachers. And uh, we, I, I just want to give you a big, uh, a little back, background of like uh, what we did before we developed the MOOC. Uh, we uh, actually uh, delivered uh, online courses for participants. Uh, they were like a very small groups of maximum uh, 15 participants, and they had a very extensive support by moderator. They were actually uh, creating their own Moodle MOOC their own project and uh, the moderator was giving them uh, support and feedback all the time. Uh, but uh, this model is, is what well, the learning outcomes were very, very good, but uh, this model was very costly. Uh, it cost about 30 euro, euro per participant. And uh, we actually in, in four or five years from 2009 till 2013, we actually uh, managed to educate 360 participants in uh, 24 groups and uh, it looks like uh, we need a lot of time to uh, educate all our users i already told you that we are hosting at the moment more than 5000 uh, courses so we, we were looking for another model and uh, when we discovered mooc it was uh, a very good solution to our problem because we uh, could include uh, many participants at the same time uh, but in order to do so, we had to change uh, the uh, course itself, the design of, of course. And uh, earlier we had very extensive support from by moderator, and now we had to kind of share this uh, efforts of moderator with participants and also with the system. That means that there are a lot of automated uh, activities. Uh, but the, the costs are very low, about two euro per participant and also we managed to educate uh, 1150 participants in just in three groups uh, in two years uh, our target group uh, is primar primarily teachers uh, at all educational levels in croatia but also in region because uh, croatian language is spoken or under understandable by uh, people from uh, region like from countries like Slovenia or Serbia or Bosnia so uh, many participants from those countries also attended our, our course and uh, they were very thankful for us because they don't have uh, opportunities like this in their countries so we are very proud of that, of that. Uh, we actually we also wanted to kind of um, the, adva the advantages of MOOC uh, to use that uh, because uh, we could uh, use this networking uh, issue, how to say, uh, a lot of people at the same time, at the same place, uh, discussing the same thing. So we wanted them to share their knowledge. So we changed our course uh, in a way that we uh, provided, we offered three different learning paths for users. So uh, some users who actually wanted to learn how to uh, design and develop an online course, they could uh, join the course. But also those who maybe uh, don't have enough uh, pre-knowledge or they don't want to do that, they, they just want to see some possibilities of Moodle or maybe to get experience in attending that kind of, of course, Moodle, MOOC. Uh, we also gave them opportunity. They had some, uh, like to say, light version of our course. And also we wanted to attract people who already are teachers who are using Moodle and who want to share their knowledge with other users. So we, we actually uh, managed to do so. And we have three different kind of users. And uh, I, I was very happy that, that to see that some experienced users share their knowledge with beginners. And this was a very uh, good thing and kind of bonus for our uh, course.
Uh, I'm sorry, uh, this, uh, this is not very good visible, uh, but I'm going to tell you that uh, we had uh, like, uh, we had more than, um, I, I said more than uh, 1,150 participants and uh, about 20% of the participants actually uh, got at least one of the badges. I'm going to tell you more about that. So uh, the, the participants were very successful uh, which is uh, like uh, more than actual average of, of MOOCs of, in general. Uh, we also did some um, research on who were our users and uh, most of them, 70% uh, were w women, but this, is like, uh, this just reflects uh, actually the, the whole population uh, of teachers in Croatia. Uh, schools with, which in and, and universities which is uh, about the same uh, and uh, this is very uh, interesting that uh, average age was about 40 years uh, and uh, about 60 percent of participants they uh, worked in schools more than 10 years because we often often hear in Croatia that uh, uh, people who are young that they are more eager to use technology but uh, this, this is not the case in, in our MOOC but it looked like the, that more experienced teachers uh, tend to use technology more. Uh, so we had about 37% uh, of teachers from, from primary schools, about the same from secondary schools, and about 15% of teachers from higher education institutions, but also there were about 20% of other participants, like some government institutions or even uh, commercial companies. Uh, we, uh, of course, we wanted to uh, give some kind of credentials to our users. Uh, we wanted to, uh, to uh, also, we thought that it was a good way to motivate them. And, but uh, we are an uh, institution that is accredited for uh, adult education. But uh, in Croatia, uh, there is a pretty um, complex uh, procedure uh, if you want to, for your course or program to get um, formal uh, recognition. So we decided to use our uh, badges, uh, which we thought uh, they will, will be a very good motivator for uh, our participants, but also that uh, they will be kind of, um, let's say, uh, badges, they give insight in what actually they have learned. So each badge uh, is, except they have, of course, name and, um, issuer, which is current in this case, uh, also uh, they include uh, all learning outcomes that the participants have actually uh, achieved. So we had uh, three different kinds of badges. Uh, I already told you that there were uh, three different uh, learning paths. We had, uh, the first one was uh, Carnet Moodle MOOC participant, then Carnet Moodle MOOC designer, and uh, Carnet Moodle MOOC distinguished participants for those experienced users wanted to share their knowledge with others. Uh, the uh, participants could uh, share their badges uh, in Moodle uh, system, but also via open badges uh, in their uh, other, I don't know, maybe LinkedIn on, or, or some other their accounts or uh, network. Uh, and we also, um, the, the participants also use these uh, badges uh, to get uh, recognition from uh, agency. Uh, in Croatia, this is education and uh, teacher uh, development agency, who actually uh, recognize those uh, badges as uh, one kind of prerequisite for teachers who want to uh, get promoted. Uh, this is kind of maybe a gray zone because uh, the rules for promotion of teachers are very outdated, and uh, these kind of, of uh, credentials like uh, badges, they're actually not included, but since we are a uh, government institution and we are credited for adult education, uh, actual evaluators who, uh, who uh, evaluate teacher for their promotion, they actually, in most cases, uh, recognize uh, these badges. Uh, participant success uh, was pretty high. 
uh, about 20% of them, uh, they uh, successfully uh, finished the course, uh, but they, they actually uh, earned uh, about 590 badges. Uh, it, it's, uh, it was uh, pretty mystical to us because uh, as you can see that uh, each participant uh, earned 2.5 badges on average. It means that they actually wanted to earn all three badges um, no matter uh, that those learning paths were aimed at very different uh, learning groups, uh, but they were very, very eager to earn the badges, so they did so. Uh, they were also very satisfied with the course. Uh, the, these uh, three, four, five, they uh, correspond like uh, grades in schools. 73% uh, of them were very satisfied, about 24% were satisfied with the course. And uh, since um, we think that this is a very good model for educating, for training uh, our users, uh, we, we are going to deliver Moodle MOOC uh, for two groups in, in our eSchools project, with, with, which is uh, now uh, actual, uh, which is running right now, uh, this uh, huge uh, structural project which is aimed at development of digital maturity of uh, 150 Croatian schools. Uh, this is, at the moment, uh, we are running the pilot uh, project uh, until 2018, and then we are going to uh, to, to run the, we, we call it the big project for, let's say, about 60% of uh, all Croatian schools. And we think that the MOOC is one of the modes that we are going to use for teacher training uh, for development of digital competencies in this project, but also in our other training programs. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you can contact me if you have any questions. Uh, here's my email address. Okay, uh, thank you, Gordana, uh, Gordana, for a very interesting uh, uh, case. Um, can you tell us a little about how a teacher reacted about the possibility for validation of, of uh, their badges? Uh, was it important to them? Uh, how much did they ask uh, about it? Uh, it, was, uh, it was very, very important for them. I already told you that it was a, a huge motivator for them. And uh, Sometimes there were some errors in the system and they were calling us, they were uh, sending us email, where is my uh, badge, I did all the activities uh, I, I was required to, but I didn't get the badge, so it was very important for them. Uh, and also they, uh, for example, it, it was of course digital badge, but they asked us to how they can print the badges, because they always want to have something like physical to have, uh, like certificate uh, kind of uh, yeah. award for them. Yes, some kind of certificate, yeah. let's say. And uh, I, I would also like to comment on the mm -hmm. uh, results of, yes, of the question, uh, questionnaire. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to hear the results that, for example, that uh, most participants think, or all participants think, that any institution can issue certificates or awards, because we, uh, as a, we, are, we are not a formal uh, institution, and uh, sometimes this uh, this is some kind of disadvantage, but uh, advantage of Carnet as a non-formal provider of education is that we are, uh, how to say, on the edge of new technologies. We are always trying to uh, to give uh, our uh, users uh, something new to uh, to uh, try new approaches, and this is something that actually teachers in creation need because. The initial training was uh, a long time ago, and the technology and uh, the teaching method and so uh, anything else they need, they they are, are now very different than then. And uh, I think that the gap between actual requirements from employers and uh, from actual knowledge that they uh, possess that we can uh, kind of um, be there to to okay. manage that. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the, the participants can ask questions in the chat uh, for our, our speakers. Uh, maybe Andrea, you can uh, comment on this uh, second question as well about uh, the certificate for qualification. Uh, you see uh, the results. Uh, so uh, should there be a difference uh, 
on institution or a person who can issue some kind of certificate for qualification of some uh, non-formal school uh, uh, certification. And then what with the certificates, how they will be recognized uh, uh, by the some kind of uh, employer or uh, 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 some kind of agency who is going to, to use these uh, uh, credentials, uh, certificates uh, for recognition. I was actually, actually thinking about it um, a bit more now, just reading uh, the answers or the, po the possible answers uh, for this question. And I must say that more than one answer should be allowed. Let me see, can I do that? Probably I can, right? I can click more than one answer. Yeah, great. Why is that? Because, first of all, I think we need to, uh, I think to, to, have, to have things clear, no, and I can only uh, speak from our perspective here. Normally, we don't have certification for informal education, okay? Because, because we understand that it does not exist as such a course cannot have an informal course what you would because if it's a course it has some sort of structure of content behind it some sort of path of learning path no matter what it is but there is some thinking behind it with the intention to learn so it's, it's all about intentionality so we wouldn't use in, an informal course as such uh, but so we would say perhaps the, the way we understand is that no, for informal learning, we don't offer certification because there is no structure behind and there's no intention to learn uh, and to achieve learning outcomes specifically, okay? Now, for a non-formal course, which I think is perhaps uh, more suitable in that question, uh, then I would say that um, more than one answer is possible because as, as already happens, an accredited educational institution can offer an informal course like a MOOC, for example, or an open educational resource learning path that is not linked to their uh, course offer on, on any degree course or is not leading to any final certificate or degree certification. It's totally a free non-formal course. And can they issue certification? Of course they can. Um, any institution or company, of course they can. You know, at work, you can take a, a, a non-formal course and receive a certification of participation that you achieved the, the learning outcomes of that particular course, although it's non-formal, it perhaps don't have, doesn't have any formality outside your work environment, for example, you know? Uh, an individual, why not? Why not? If an individual is an expert on something um, and decides to teach uh, you know, informally gets together a group of people to, that are interested in getting the knowledge of this individual. Why not? Um, so I think non-formal certificates can be issued by pretty much everyone, really. The problem is how to recognize them later on. Okay. I agree with you. Uh, we have to think very much about uh, recognition. Um, uh, do you think, Irina, this recognition uh, uh, should be uh, uh, clearly stated in the some strategies of the institutions or in the in the national level, uh, or uh, not only national but European or or uh, the the global level? Because uh, what we have at the moment is with the qualification uh, framework that uh, we need to adjust the qualifications for the formal learning. Um, uh, through the all uh, on a global level in order that people have this mobility so uh, what about this uh, non formal learning uh, uh, to be uh, to to make clearly what are the uh, what is the framework when someone applies uh, with a certification with rec uh, a certification of non -far non formal learning Actually, what uh, has already happened, and uh, we want it or not, uh, I do want it a lot, <laughs> is that uh, Open Learning and the Open Learning Initiative affected already, without any chance to go back, all formal learning, higher education, that, every, any, any level of education or informal learning. 
and I'm very happy about it. And we have already surveys actually proving that the biggest impact is upon the improvement of curriculum. So now uh, we, uh, we are discussing already uh, the educational offer from formal, uh, from formal learning and formal education providers. Uh, when we speak about higher education, we see that, and we already discussed uh, during this week in, in other days, that actually in Europe, sometimes uh, at some points in the history we went too far. But actually maybe there was a setting and the context that required that. What we have in higher education is four-year programs based on learning outcomes, then master programs, and now we already discussed the need for short-term programs for open learning, for open curriculum and how to integrate that and recognize that and that is already inevitable we will never go back so we want it or not it will it will need to, to happen it will take place and uh, now universities just think how to do it so they don't go and uh, develop necessarily all open courses uh, but they think how to integrate open courses and how to use them in formal curricula and how to recognize it and it is very good so uh, actually it is in the process i think we need discuss discuss now only how to do it and of course uh, it can be done both ways either top down or bottom up uh, but as uh, in, in case of higher education, I believe that universities have a high autonomy and they will need to discuss it first before it even reaches uh, some maybe national regulations. Unless we have very, very good examples coming from one or two countries on how to implement and mainstream it. And then we can suggest to other countries to pick it up and maybe apply it. But of course, contexts are very diverse and member states have very diff different experiences and priorities. So I don't think if, if this can be done unanimously and in one way. Uh, we, we can't speak about one way in Europe. I think we, ha we are too diverse. So uh, my, my suggestion would be to, to, to discuss on any occasion how to do that but that, that it, it is coming and uh, of course the future of universities will be that we will have to mainstream in, in one or another way what, uh, what we uh, have now as mainstream education. However, open uh, services and non-formal education will be in the context of the same institutions and they will need to do it. And they are already doing it, but I think we are in search of the best scenarios that meet the uh, labor market needs that meet the needs of the companies and I think what is still missing we uh, we approached in in, uh, in many cases and there were initiatives and from lifelong learning program and from Erasmus program and from other in initiatives on how to strengthen the collaboration between enterprises between companies and universities but um, still uh, when we come back to the curriculum you know those uh, Quality assurance requirements from, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes regulations, they um, allow less flexibility than we wish. And in this aspect, uh, universities, uh, administration, but also teachers become very tired even before they start introducing uh, these flexibilities and innovations. And I think from on, on, one, on, on one hand they want, they are motivated, they are enthusiastic, they want to introduce it, but on the other hand, before they are able to do this, uh, they are already tired. So what I would start uh, maybe uh, discussing also as one important item is how we could a little bit minimize the requirements that restrict us from flexible introduction yeah. of these Thank you. Uh, uh, you have right. Uh, the flexibility today is very important because the the environment, the uh, uh, the situation, uh, in some way dictates uh, uh, the the things uh, how things will uh, go on. For example, uh, the the immigrants uh, are, are completely new uh, target group, uh, which has also be which has recently become very very huge amount of of people and something very. Uh, a necessary important to think uh, about. 
but the, going back to to the preparation uh, of uh, of such an uh, non formal courses uh, uh, and flexibility, um, can you share, Gordon, uh, your experience? What was the framework or some qualification standards uh, in preparation of this course of yours? What was were your guidelines uh, when you started with preparation of this uh, MOOC course? Uh, in, in part, we, we um, take uh, some kind of uh, uh, practical approach. Uh, we want uh, our uh, users to learn of, by doing or uh, to, to do some uh, project work. So this is something that is uh, most important for us. Uh, so uh, I don't think that we uh, followed any standards, but uh, the, the learning method, uh, method, we wanted them to try and to learn in that way. And we also uh, give them some kind of uh, model uh, for them to use uh, those kinds of methods in uh, creation schools. Uh, maybe uh, the audience is not so familiar with the situation in creation schools. Um, uh, there is, uh, how to say, um, the uh, teaching is very uh, traditional and pre theoretical, and there is a huge uh, gap between uh, what students uh, learn in schools and what they actually can um, use in everyday uh, situations and on their uh, working places. So we want to uh, to uh, take this approach that we actually uh, have hands-on activities. Uh, we also use some new approaches like connectivism. We want them to uh, share and learn from each other. I know that this is not the answer to your question, but this is uh, actually what were our how can I say guidelines when we uh, started this uh, Moodle MOOC. Yeah, that, that is very important because you have to think about the target group to be able to follow the, the course. Uh, so you have to think of a, a special, in which way to prepare the course in order to be uh, uh, more friendly at, for, for them. Uh, okay, uh, do we have some questions from participants? Uh, maybe then, maybe uh, we, ha we have mentioned several times uh, um, the uh, learning outcomes. So, um, should the methods for validating learning outcomes required through open education resources be, be the same as uh, learn methods for learning outcomes in formal learning? Um, I give floor to any of the speakers uh, who want to comment uh, on this. But Sandra, can you please uh, uh, tell us? So, um, it should be uh, uh, the ways of uh, validating learning outcomes, the, the assessment methods, uh, the the uh, the if you look at the Bloom taxonomy, uh, how the learning outcomes have been designed, uh, should these methods be the same in in non formal uh, uh, courses or as in in formal uh, uh, courses? Uh, for example, uh, you can say that uh, for for uh, to fulfill uh, some learning outcomes in uh, non formal course, uh, it's enough that you understand something. Uh, but uh, in a formal course, uh, the learning outcome can be, for example, some analysis or synthesis, synthesizing, uh, synergize something, you know, they, may be, they can be much higher. So, uh, can we compare these uh, ways of uh, uh, validating uh, learning outcomes in, uh, in this different environment? Uh. I, I, I could comment here a little bit. I think, you know, uh, actually what uh, unites education providers in bed, in higher education, doesn't matter, in non-formal or formal learning, is that up to now, uh, organization that uh, certifies or validates uh, learning outcomes or competences, if we speak about that, we all request for, uh, I just forgot one word, which is best, uh, we all request for evidence, for evidence-based proof. So whether it is competence or skill, uh, we request uh, the, the learner who comes with prior learning or with non-formal learning 
to prove that actually those competences and skills exist. I give you an example. Uh, even before I read the, uh, the report on validation of non-formal movies learning, in our university we have, uh, for example, uh, maybe experience of uh, seven years when there is a regulation that people can come and register for the study program and then keep they should bring evidence that they have certain either learning outcomes achieved or competences, you know, achieved and then they have a discussion with the uh, professor uh, who usually requests the evidence for that. Either, you know, a portfolio, a certification, anything. So actually this is uh, in all cases uh, in terms of recognition and uh, these things unite all different scenarios, I think all education providers, also companies, if you come to a company and say, you know, I'm the Bachelor of Economics, actually maybe the, com the, uh, the boss of the company would ask uh, to prove uh, through the duration of several months that the person is suitable for the job, that uh, he or she has the competences needed for the job. But now I think what we are opening up is a, a little bit uh, broader definition of recognition, talking in terms of the learning path, talking in terms of the, uh, the process of the learning and how we already integrate recognition elements at the very early stages and try to monitor the learning process so that we are able to match uh, recognition and validation in formal learning with recognition and validation in open learning, in a non-formal learning, and sometimes even maybe, uh, maybe until maybe in informal learning. Uh, but if systems are in place and if the tools allow us to do that with a verified learner identity, I think this would be maybe a solution to uh, facilitate a recognition from informal and open learning into uh, formal uh, education. Sorry for this complicated answer, but that is... And I don't think we may discuss the levels of uh, cognitive taxonomy or psychomotoric or uh, other type of taxonomy, affective taxonomy, because I think this is already the object of the curriculum design. And even though we touch upon curriculum design in any of the cases, but definition of learning objectives or learning outcomes or competences is actually the uh, the issue okay, of thank the you. system. Um, we have one question here in the chat. Um, have you met skepticism or opposition to these initiatives and how have you dealt with it? Um, maybe Andrea, you can comment it. speak from the research side because uh, we are not, we don't provide yeah. certification here <laughs> at all. Uh, skepticism, no actually what we've encountered quite a lot is the discussion of how difficult it is actually to, to come up with, um, with a path for, rec for, creden for credentialing, credentialization of non-formal learning and for recognizing it. So normally universities uh, tend to say, look, no matter how much we try, sometimes we are stuck because the existing system has to do uh, with recognition of prior learning, RPL, okay? Um, and what we try to do is to, cre to create a fast track for that because normally RPL is something that is very uh, slow in time. You know, it takes a long time for a student which decides to apply for RPL to go through the whole process and get it, uh, their learning recognized or get new credentials or their learning recognized. Um, and because what the skepticism, and I wouldn't say skepticism, but what has appeared in our research is that some lecturers may have, for example, for example, uh, in the RPL context, um, if you apply for it and then you may come across to having to go through a particular faculty and speak to a particular professor because he is the one who is the expert in that subject that you want to get your learning recognized and then that professor sometimes uh, thinks okay if you didn't study here our teaching is better here and uh, therefore you, you are going to have to do complementary courses to be able to, to get your learning recognized or it's, it's a little bit about ego, it's a little bit of a matter of trust 
they sometimes don't trust the other university. I mean, I, I'm not really sure they have done it as well as they should have done it, or you know. So these sort of things. So we discuss the trust matter in the in the open credit report as well, and this is in trust. Uh, is important for recognition as much as transparency. This is why we see some transparency. The more transparent we make uh, our non-formal courses in terms of what has been studied, the content, the ways we created assessment, the, the roots, the, um, the identi identification of the learner, the more transparency we upfront make available, um, the easier it is to, for recognition later on. So I would say that trust perhaps is one of the of the items that came up in our research. Lack of trust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You mentioned also e-portfolio uh, for recognition of learning path, and I think it's a, it is a, a good idea. But also the formative uh, uh, assessment is in in some way uh, um, recognizing the learning path because when you are following the learner through uh, the whole course, then you actually know how he's progressing during uh, all the time uh, in, in the course. So uh, uh, following learning path, uh, it, it is not easy when you have a huge number of students in the course, but in the smaller courses, I would say it, it is much, uh, uh, it is much easier. Uh, okay, so uh, we are coming. Uh, to the end of uh, today's uh, uh, webinar, um, let's stay tuned with us. Uh, uh, tomorrow we have another webinar uh, on digital skills. Uh, my favorite topic, although I won't be able to participate as I'll be traveling, but my colleague uh, Lisa Mari Blaschke is going to moderate it, and uh, uh, they are really a good choice of speakers there, so I'm inviting all of you to join us again tomorrow at 1 o'clock and follow the webinar. Um, I'm thinking, uh, I wish to thank uh, my speakers today for time and energy and willingness to participate and share their expertise. So thank everyone uh, for participating and thank you all for joining us. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye.